fourth Sunday in Lent. We're back here again in Yucca, in California here. In the epistle for this fourth Sunday is taken from St. Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 4. Brethren, it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman and the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, but he of the free woman was born by promise. Which things are said by an allegory. For these are the two testaments, the one from Mount Sinai, engendering unto bondage, which is Agar. For Sinai is a mountain in Arabia, which hath affinity to that Jerusalem, which now is, and is in, in, and in, is in bondage with her children. But that Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice thou, barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For many are the children of the desolate, more than of her that hath a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then he that was born according to the flesh persecuted him that was after the Spirit, so also it is now that but, but, but what saith the Spirit, what saith the Scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not the children of the bondwoman, but of the free. By the freedom with Christ has made us free. And then the gospel is taken with that according to St. John chapter 6. At that time, Jesus went over to the Sea of Galilee, which is that of Tiberias. And a great multitude followed him, because they saw the miracles which he, had, which he did on them that were diseased. Jesus therefore went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the past, the festival of the Jews, festival day of the Jews was near at hand. When Jesus therefore had lifted up his eyes, and seeing that a very great multitude cometh unto him, he said to Philip, When shall we buy bread that, that, uh, that these may eat? And he, this he said to try him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered, Two hundred pennyworth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one may eat, may take a little. Once of his disciples, and one of his disciples, Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, saith to him, There is a boy here that hath five barley loaves and two fishes. But what are these among so many? Then Jesus said, Make the men to sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. The men therefore sat down, in number about five thousand. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given them given thanks, he distributed them to them that were sat down. In like manner also of the fishes, as much as they would. And when they were filled, he said to his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, lest they be lost. They gathered up, therefore, and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above to them that had eaten. Now those men, when they had seen what a miracle Jesus had done, said, This is of a truth, the prophet that is to come unto the world. Jesus, therefore, when he knew that they would come to take, to take him by force and make him king, fled again into the mountain, himself alone. Thus far the words of today's Holy Gospel. So I am a Father, that's only goes to men. A few considerations on this day of Laetare Sunday. This is called the Rejoice Sunday in the middle of the season of Lent. And a Laetare, on this Laetare Sunday, we are laying the foundations and the consideration of the greatest gift that God ever gave to man. And this gift is the most blessed sacrament, which is meat indeed and blood that is drink indeed. And being a most sacred gift, he prepared the people of God of the Old Testament and the people of God of the New Testament in a most special way 
for this sacred gift. We read about the preparation in the Old Testament in the bravery reading of today from the, from the, from the book of, of Exodus. Moses had been 40 years married. 40 years before he was with the Egyptians and then 40 years married and raising his children and he was a shepherd like his great ancestors before him. And this particular day, he saw a burning bush. And he went and saw that the bush was burning, but that it was not being consumed and not being destroyed. There are many burning bushes in the desert and the mountains. There's nothing special about that. But this particular burning bush was on fire, but the fire did not consume the bush. This fire that burns greater than any other fire, and does not consume the bush. This is the fire that attracted Moses. This fire is meant to burn inside of us when we receive Holy Communion. This fire is the fire that came to us when God the Son sent the Holy Ghost, who is also called the fire of the Father and the Son, to be our life, so that we will be burnt up. Do we follow Jesus Christ? He said, if you want to be my disciple, take up your cross and follow me. That's what he said. And we will follow, and we shall be burnt up. There shall be fire consuming us. But if we follow as Christ and we are attracted to the burning bush of Christ, we will discover that even though the fire burns and burns and burns, we are never consumed. This is the fire that comes into our souls by the power of the Holy Eucharist. Now today a consideration of a great temptation of our times. And not only a temptation of our times, but in fact, it has been a temptation of many saints and of many times in history. And that is the temptation to receive Holy Communion. We, are, we think we know that which we need. But consider the preparation of our Lord Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. He brought his disciples to the top of the mountain and they followed him because he performed miracles. We read the Gospels, chapter 6, of one of the longest Gospels in the Gospel of St. John, I think the longest Gospel, the longest chapter. And at the beginning of this chapter, we read in the Gospel today. Whenever we hear John chapter 6, we know this is the Gospel of St. John in which he said, my, my, my flesh is meat indeed and my blood is drink indeed. And there are two sacred and interesting moments of this chapter. The first one is considered today on Laetare Sunday. He fed the 5,000 and they ate all kinds of bread and they had their fill. And there was a lot of leftovers, 12 baskets, only five barley loaves and two fishes to begin. Everyone was full and completely satiated with all the food. They were stuffed. And there were yet 12 bar baskets left over. And they were ablaze and they believed in him because he had multiplied the bread. And therefore they wanted to make him king. They wanted to make him king. What was the end of this desire? Jesus Christ is our king. He wants to be our king. He wants to be treated as our king. But because he really is a king, he does not allow himself to be treated as king under our conditions, which a lesser man and weak man would do. But rather, because he really is king, he will not accept us receiving him as king unless we accept him under his kingly conditions. And they wanted him to be king. They accepted him as king. But what are the last words of the gospel today? And Jesus fled into the mountain alone. Ipse solus. 
He fled into the mountain himself alone. That is not a very happy ending of this miracle. They believed in him. They saw the 5,000 globes turn and, and multiplied, and they were very happy, and they wanted him to be a king. And they wanted to make him king to fight against the Romans, to make the Jews great amongst all the people in the world, to lord it over their brethren and over their enemies. And our Lord Jesus Christ fled into the mountain himself alone. The next day he comes back down the mountain. And the remainder of the chapter of St. John is on the next day where he comes down the mountain and he has a long discussion with the Jews. These 5,000, not considering women and children, so about 20,000 people in the desert. He conceives these 20,000 standing before him and they wanted to make him king yesterday. And they firmly believed in him yesterday. And they had the strongest faith that could be had yesterday. And now it is a new day. And they are so happy to see him. But what does he do? He has a hard saying. If only he didn't have hard sayings. My flesh is meat indeed. My blood is drink indeed. And unless you eat my flesh... And unless you drink my blood, you shall not have life in you. You shall die. And they walked away from him. Now yesterday the Lord Jesus Christ was in the mountain, Ipse Solus, because he fled into the mountain. Because he flees away from those who do not love him as he wishes to be loved. He flees away from those who do not know him as he wishes to be known and as he should be known. And he flees away from those who serve him, who do not serve him as he wishes to be served. He flees away from them. This is the case of all the so-called Protestants and all the so-called Christians and all the so-called believers in our Lord Jesus Christ who do not believe him as he demands to be believed, who do not love him as he demands to be loved. They do not serve him as he demands to be served. They serve under their own conditions and love under their own conditions and believe what they choose to believe and reject what they do not wish to believe. They don't accept him as the king of kings, but as their elected king, like a president of the United States, who is elected and supposed to do what the people want. God is not elected, he is God. Jesus Christ is not elected, he is king. He does not do what the people want. He commands the people to do what he wants. And when his will is fulfilled, there is peace, and there is happiness, and there is goodness, and there is truth. And there is all thing good everywhere in the world. But when he is disobeyed, there is all evil. He fled to the mountain himself alone. The next day he comes down and he does not flee. He stands in the desert with 20,000 people around him. But what is the conclusion of John chapter 6? Jesus Christ is in the desert himself alone. Only with his disciples with him. And they are not really with him either. They are confused. And they don't believe. And they are thinking of leaving also. He is completely alone. And he turns finally and says, Since you feel this way, since you are also doubting me, like all these 6,000, 5,000 people, and the 20,000, are you going to leave me also? Will you leave me also? And they don't say, No, we're not going to leave you. They don't know what to say. But the Holy Ghost inspires Simon Peter, and St. Simon Peter, he is now beginning to become a saint, though he's not there yet. He also does not understand. He is also confused. He also didn't learn from the miracles. He's not better than the crowd that walked away. But he does one thing that makes him greater, and that is he says, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou alone hast the words of eternal life. I don't know where else to go. Simon doesn't know much. 
but he knows a lot. Because he knows there is no other place to go than Jesus Christ. Now he's beginning to be formed to be the head of our holy church. Now he's beginning to learn, though he doesn't know it, what it means to be, a, to be the rock upon which Christ will build his church. He's learning. But in the school of pain, in the school of misunderstanding, in the school that is a supernatural school, which is a school that is not like the school on earth. The conclusion of the Gospel of St. John, chapter 6, was likened to the conclusion of this part of the Gospel today. Christ is alone. Going back to the Old Testament, which we'll read throughout the entirety of this week, the story of Moses, the most wonderful saint of the Old Testament. Moses. Moses, what does he do? He will make the great miracle of the Red Sea. He will make the Jewish people to escape Pharaoh. And the entirety of the army of Pharaoh shall be destroyed. There won't be one left alive. They shall peacefully cross over that sea. And then what? They will have to wander for 40 years in a desert. We must understand, as we travel through the supernatural life, that when the devil is wiped out by a good confession, and the devil is wiped out by holy baptism, and the devil is wiped out by a plenary indulgence, and the devil is wiped out by the perfect reception of any sacrament or receiving of any grace perfectly, we have killed the devil like Pharaoh's army in the Red Sea. But we have arrived in a desert and we are still in this world and we have 40 years to travel. And in these 40 years, there will be many struggles. The devil will come back across that river, across the Red Sea, across that ocean, across that sea. And he will still come and tempt us in the desert and we will have to persevere for 40 years, which means the whole of life. And what shall sustain us during this life? During life, we need food to sustain us. We are in a supernatural fight. We cannot survive without supernatural food. And therefore, we find that during the 40 years of the desert, every single day, the Jews ate manna which is the symbol of the Holy Blessed Sacrament. Now know this about the contradiction and mystery of manna. Manna only lasted one day. You take the manna and you eat it and you consume it. If you save extra leftover manna, it would spoil and be destroyed in the night. There was no possibility of having manna that could last more than one day. It was perfectly good for one day, and then it was gone and destroyed after that. No matter how much you stored, no matter what techniques you used to preserve the manna, manna could not be preserved. And hence, the first part of the mystery of the Blessed Sacraments. It is food for one day. When our Lord Jesus Christ said, Give us this day our daily bread, and the old English, our super substantial bread, our consubstantial bread. Give us this day our consubstantial bread. Give us this day our daily bread. When we say give us this day our daily bread, it is the bread for one day. And hence the Holy Eucharist cannot be received more than once in one day. It is one of the abuses of the post-Vatican II world that many times Catholics will go to church in the morning and receive Holy Communion. Then they'll go again and receive Holy Communion a second time. It's a sacrilege to do that. And receive Holy Communion a third time. And one of the mysteries of the Mass but today I'll say several Masses, but I will receive Holy Communion only once. When I consume the host at the Mass, I consume it as the priest of God, destroying the victim. And that is why the People's Communion is never ever with the faithful, with the communion of the priest. It is always at two separate times of the Mass. I receive the Holy Communion and destroy the host. Destroy the victim, which must be completely destroyed in order that the sacrifice may be complete. Hence, for instance, if the host somehow is taken away by an animal, 
or somehow it's blown away by the wind, and somehow the host cannot be found, and there are hosts in the tabernacle, I cannot take a coast from the tabernacle and consume it. I must consecrate a new host and consume that new host because the sacrifice is nik et nunc, here and now, and it must be completed. And this is the first part of the mystery of the Blessed Sacrament. Manna is good only for one day. But let us consider the last day that manna fell. On the very last day that manna fell, before Joshua brought the Jewish people out of the land of Egypt, of Arabia and crossed the Red Sea, manna fell for the last time. It would ever fall in human history. Joshua took some of this manna and he put it inside the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant has not yet been destroyed. It is hidden. It was hidden by the prophet Jeremiah and it shall remain hidden until the end of the world. During the time of, the, of, the, of Enoch and Elias, the, manna, the Ark of the Covenant shall be brought forth again and shall have a part to do with the conversion of the Jews. And when that Ark is opened up at the end of the world, there shall be manna inside of it. It shall have been preserved. A food that is good for our bodies. Came from heaven, but it's a food that's good for our bodies and sustains only our body. It is not the Blessed Sacrament. But this manna that fell 1,500 years before Jesus Christ was born, now we are over 2,000 years after he died, that manna that can only last one day is now 3,500 years old. And that manna is not corrupt. It is the same manna that fell every day in the desert. And here we have the second part of the mystery of the Blessed Sacrament. The first part of the mystery is that it is enough for one day, and it is our daily bread, and we must take it daily. The second part of the mystery of the Blessed Sacrament is that to take it once in life is more than enough. For to receive the holy manna, which, does, which was received on that last day by the Jews, and which is the symbol of the Blessed Sacrament that we receive, that manna, that last bit of manna lasts until the very ending of the world. When the world comes to an end, on the day that God comes to judge the Antichrist, that little piece of wafer bread that was fell from heaven 4,000, 3,500 years ago, that manna shall still be present at the end of the world. And hence you remember the two sides of the Blessed Sacrament. Enough for one day. Receive daily communion if you can. But once in life is more than enough for a single lifetime, which lasts only a hundred years. This shall last forever, the taste of this sacred food. And hence we see also in the Old Testament that one day Elias, he also had to eat bread given to him by an angel. And the angel told him, walk for 40 days on the drink of that food. And he walked for 40 days and 40 nights. And his 40 days were not like the 40 days of Christ in the desert. When Jesus Christ walked was fasted in the desert, he felt the pains of hunger. And he suffered. When Elias walked for 40 days on the strength of that food, he did not feel any hunger. He did not have any diminishing of strength. He was completely satiated and the bread sustained him for the entirety of the 40 days that he had eaten 40 days before and he walked 40 days on the strength of that food. And here this tells us also about that second part of the mystery of the Blessed Sacrament. Once is enough for a lifetime. And yet we should receive every day if we can. What is the rule? Our Lord Jesus Christ came down the mountain. He came down that mountain and he, he said, I am now telling you about the miracle of the Blessed Sacrament. You saw me raise people from the dead. You saw me turn bread and multiply it and multiply the fishes also. You now have enough information to know that I am God. You have heard me speak only the truth. Now I'm going to give you the greatest of gifts, which is my own flesh. I want you to eat my own flesh. I want you to drink my own blood. This is my greatest gift to you. And they should have been so amazed that God made in flesh would give us his own flesh to eat, his own blood to drink, that just like God the Father poured out his entire divinity 
into God the Son. So Jesus Christ, in imitation of his Father, in his humanity, is going to pour out his whole body, his whole blood, his whole soul, his whole passions, his whole humanity, united with his divinity, into us. This is the most wonderful gift. And the people were disgusted because they did not understand here is the trouble about our path to sanctity. As we are on the journey to God, we know him and we love him and we serve him so long as he makes sense to us. But when the time comes that it's a little bit too difficult, that's a little too hard, we say, no, I'm sorry, you've gone too far, God. You've gone too far. Forget it. Hence, in our situation in the church today, we're reminded of the great example of our times, which is St. Joan of Arc. She was tempted to receive Holy Communion. She was told by the priests of God, if you do not deny the voices, if you do not submit to the judgment of the authorities of the church, we bishops, two bishops involved in her condemnation, we priests, 30 or 40 priests involved in her condemnation, we theologians and our doctors and authorities of the church, and you were only a 19-year-old girl and never learned how to read. You speak with your own accent. You can't even speak the proper language. And you know better than us. We are the authorities of the church. And unless you say that you did not hear voices from heaven, and unless you say that you lied, you will not be allowed to receive Holy Communion. She had to say, no, I will not say that I lied. Then you are a devil. They said to her, you are a devil. How can you say, Joan, that you love God when you were rejecting Holy Communion? You are a devil. Come forward 500, 600 years. There were 20 or 30 priests in that crowd. There were two bishops. Who cares what their names were? Who knows about them? They are forgotten. Because they did not know God as he wished to be known. They did not love him as he wished to be loved. They did not serve him as he wished to be served. And they used their knowledge of theology and their power as priests of the church to turn a little girl away from God. And they failed. And she is called saint. And she is in the highest place in heaven. Joan the maid. The church burnt her at the stake. It was not the pagans. It was the church. And the final two final temptations they gave to her were the first, the last final spiritual temptation was the Holy Communion. We can be tempted by the devil to do something good. And this is the temptation of the wicked church today. If you only don't condemn the errors and heresies of Vatican II, if you only don't say that they are lies, if you only don't stand up against the errors of the, of the devil and modernism in our church, and you simply say that it's okay for you to hold your own private beliefs, if you believe in all the truths of the church, hold them as private beliefs, but don't let them be beliefs that are to be believed by all. Don't, quote, unquote, force them upon others. Then we can let you receive the Holy Communion. And many souls say, I need Holy Communion. It is my daily bread. I know what I need. I know what I need. What do we need? We need Christ. We need obedience to his law. We need his word. We need the Holy Mother Church and all her teachings. But many times in the history of the church, New Testament and Old Testament, remember the Old Testament church is the same as our church. It was just in a different stage because it was before Christ came. Hence it is called the Old Testament. 
But in this church, Old and New Testament, at many times in its history, there have been bishops, there have been priests, there have been prophets, true prophets of God, who have led souls away from God. And many souls have said, well, Caiaphas told me to do it. Annas told me to do it. The Sadducees said, I have to believe this way. And so I'm going to obey the Sadducees. I'm not a theologian. I have to obey Caiaphas. I'm not a theologian. I'm just a simple soldier. And for this, they make an excuse to fall into sin. And for this, they make an excuse to step away from the truth of God. This we cannot do. The fact is, the devil is telling many souls today, you need a regular mass. We want as a regular mass as we can get. We want the most regular mass we can get. But we don't want the indulgent mass. This mass is a mass of compromise of faith. Now they change the name. Just like the communists. Russia has spread its errors throughout the world. And one of the communist errors is when they find out you've got a bad organization called the NKVD, and everyone found out in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, NKVD is a really horrible, most vile, most wicked police department of Russia, and it's very evil, so they changed the name. We are no longer the NKVD, we are now the nice KGB. And so they became the nice KGB. And then it turned out the KGB weren't any nicer than NKVD. Turned out they were the same guys, they just changed the letters on their uniforms, and they were wicked. And now they're called the National Police, a different lettering. So they did the same thing in the Catholic Church. They called it the Indult Mass. Oh, I'm against the Indult Mass because that says the new Mass is good. But now they have the Modu Proprio Mass. All they did was change the letters from NKVD to KGB. They did not change the reality. It is still a teaching of the wicked Rome today that you can't have your Latin Mass unless it is approved by the modernist bishop. The bishop can assign me where my parish is. The bishop cannot tell me whether or not I can say the Latin Mass. The bishop can tell me where I can operate and some details of that operation, but he cannot tell me that I am forbidden to hear confessions of those that are in need, that I am forbidden to give the holy sacraments to those that are dying. He cannot tell me to go against the divine law in order to follow the human church law. And this we should all know, as it says in Acts chapter 5, we obey God rather than men. And hence we have a temptation of our times. Go to an approved Latin Mass. You get to get your Holy Communion. You need it. Now remember that the people who received Holy Communion, St. Paul speaks about them, know this about those holy Jews that were in the desert. Forty years they wandered in the desert and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. But with most of them, God was not well pleased. Are you holy because you're a daily communicant? No, you are not. And remember what St. Paul said also in another place. They who eat and drink the blood of body and blood of Christ unworthily, eat it unto their own destruction. So, but thankful. He had to leave them. He would not come back for several years. My dear children... And yet you receive it from the hands of a tick or a schismatic. Give us this day our daily bread. Why do we eat that bread? Because God told us to eat it. But it is not to be eaten if it is not in communion with our Holy Mother. It is not to be eaten if it is not in communion with the true faith. It is not to be eaten if eating it means that we have to compromise our Holy Faith. Then what happens is that bread becomes not unto our, our edification but unto our destruction and hence it is a deceit of the devil to get souls to leave behind the true traditional mass and the true traditional sacraments given with the faith and go to places where there's Latin masses approved. It is a trap of the devil right now that there are approved Latin masses all over the place said by priests who are in varying degrees of ignorance of God and do not really believe all the teachings. Give us this day our daily bread. 
if that bread is in union with the church, and if we are not separating ourselves from the faith and not compromising that faith, the wisdom of St. Joan of Arc to understand not to receive a bread. St. Hermenegild is another one to speak to. St. Hermenegild was killed and killed by his own father, and he was martyred because he refused to receive Holy Communion. It was the cause of St. Hermenegild's martyrdom. He would not take Holy Communion, and it was a true Latin Mass, and it was a true Blessed Sacrament. It was the blood and soul of a body and blood and divinity of Jesus Christ, exactly the same as in this sacrament right now. The same body and blood and soul and divinity St. Hermenegild received, and therefore his father killed him, and he was martyred in the church because the bishop that was going to give him Holy Communion was an Arian heretic, and he would not receive the true body and the true soul, and the true divinity of Jesus Christ from the hands of an heretic. It is good to be in the presence of Christ. Is it good itself, or are we required to do something else? Caiaphas was in the presence of Christ, and then he mocked him. The Roman soldiers were in the presence of Christ, and there they scourged him and crowned him with thorns. The crowd was in the presence of Christ, and they watched with great interest as he died upon a cross. It is not enough to be in the presence of Christ or to receive Christ. We must be in his presence like the holy women, like St. John, like our holy mother, the mother of God. This is how we must be in the presence of Christ. And if we are separated from him as part of our test, this shall strengthen our souls. For the bread that we need every day is enough to carry us through a lifetime. And what is the strength of this bread? It is to give us the divine life inside of our hearts, inside of our souls. And so let us not trap the modernist trap of approved masses, where our faith is sucked away from us bit by bit, and a new religion is being formed. A new kind of high church Anglican Protestant religion, which is now called the conservative Catholic world, this church is not the church of Jesus Christ. It is not the one founded by him. The miraculous intervention of heaven, and it will come to wipe out the problems of these Protestant churches, and there shall be brought back the glory of the true church shall be by miraculous intervention. And between now and then, let us be faithful to the blessed sacrament and not fall into the temptation of receiving Holy Communion in places where we should not receive it. And remember also that Christ is in us. He has enough power to hold us all our days. Let us remain faithful in the church, faithful in the sacraments. For example of the holy saints, the great saints, they went through tribulations and trials, persevered. And it is true that without the blessed sacrament, we cannot persevere. But with the blessed sacrament, we can. And we have it inside of us. We have our Lord inside of us. And we remain in communion with him when we keep an ill faith inside of our minds and hearts and don't walk away from it. And close that, God bless you all then. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.